All right. Are we are we good to go in the back? Are we, should I start? All right, cool. Yeah. Right on. So I, I guess I'll begin. I, there's still people filing in, but that's cool. Um, we're like three minutes over. So um, <laughs> it's been a, an interesting con so far in terms of responsible disclosure. There have been quite a number of stories already. So this should very apropos to be the one of the last talks at con. So um, I'm Dan. Um, this is the l less interesting slide. You guys aren't here for me, or you're here for the fun stuff. So let's, let's consider the following for a moment, right? So uh, if you're perhaps a CISO or a CIO or, or a, C a CIO, a CSO or a CISO in the crowd, um, you know, what do you do if um, your staff comes to you and says, uh, there's been a critical vulnerability in one of the products that we curate discovered, right? Um, or maybe, Maybe you're a manager or a director, and a security researcher contacts you and says, I found some stuff in some of your code. You know, what do you do? Uh, maybe, maybe there is no CISO or CIO or CSO, and maybe the head of IT acts like the head of security, and uh, there's a lot of question marks, and people aren't really sure because security is kind of a secondary concern. Or maybe there's just nobody in charge of security at all, and nobody, nobody seems to care, and, and it just sort of slides off your back, and nobody gives a shit. Um, or maybe you're going to be a troll and you're going to tell the people that disclose to you that everything's legit and it's all cool and they can totally present and then they take you to court, um, right? So this is sort of the impression that I get um, from, from the sort of landscape of disclosure. And uh, we've seen quite a number of random sort of, it's a mixed bag, right? It's, you get all sorts of, and it's, it's literally this. It's this every single time. And like from the position of a person that discloses for a living effectively, um, it is, you, it's, it's totally a mixed bag. So I should back up and I should uh, first start with a story. And <laughs> there, were, there was once a company that manufactured LED billboards. Um, so probably, Three or four years ago, I was uh, piddling around on Shodan, and I found uh, this thing, Prism View, and I had no idea what it was at the time. Um, uh, it was a tangent, like a tertiary finding, and I thought, oh, this is kind of neat. What can I do with it? You know, the typical thing you do when you find something random on the internet. Let's click on it, right? So you go and you look at it, and it's like, all right, that's cool. Um, this, it looks like a sign, an advertising, a advertisement of some kind. Um, it, uh, La Habra, it's Howard's Appliance in La Habra, which is like in Southern California. So that's kind of cool. I can Google for La Habra and then I can find it on Street View and go, oh, that's, uh, that's colorful. That's a big sign that you can mess with. Hmm, that's kind of cool. So like any good nerd, I wrote uh, a bash one-liner. <laughs> and at the time, you couldn't do this. At the time, uh, Shodan didn't have a Python command line API. You actually had to write, I, and this is like one of the first things I published to GitHub, was this like terribly poorly written Python 30 line script that would go and scrape the front end of Shodan and grab stuff and, and do this. So um, this actually is, let's see if, it's, uh, if it'll let me do it. Um, I actually have it running live. Which direction are we going? There we go. It looks like that. So this is live. <laughs> um, and if I refresh it, like these are live signs in the United States that are like public, open, let's play, right? Uh, and these are the cameras that like, so there's a sign and there's a little stick that comes out of the bottom of the sign with a camera on it and the camera points back at the sign to tell whoever's running the sign that yes, what's actually displaying on the sign is what is seen. So. Um, there's a lot of these, or there were a lot more before I tried to disclose, but therein lies the story. Um, so yeah, um, I'll post my slides at some point, but that's, yeah, that's the one-liner in Bash you can use to generate that, that uh, HTML file. And yeah, it looks like this. Looks familiar, right? Um, so the cameras themselves are access cameras, and the access cameras have a really crappy default password on them. Um, and the cameras by the, the cameras are like I could do a whole other talk just on these, but like the TLDR here is uh, there's there's two fun things in an access camera you can take advantage of. One is the script editor, which is what we're looking at here. Um, it'll allow you to read write any file on the file system, like stuff in init.d, for example. Uh, and then another component, which sadly I don't have a screenshot of, is the uh, file uploading component. So. Just for reference, it's MIPS Big Endian if you're gonna spin off some Metasploit payloads. Uh, they, they work and you'll get shells on cameras. 
because, you know, how much forensic stuff happens on cameras, you know? <laughs> like, it has like 16 megs of flash or something to that effect, or like 30 megs of flash. There's probably not a lot of logging happening there. So that basically sat in the hopper for something like two years. Um, and I thought it was kind of neat, but, you know, there's not enough meat there. I can't really do anything interesting with it. And uh, then one went up near my house, and I went, oh boy. Now I have to. Now I'm obligated, right? So one of the things that I noticed was that a lot of these things are listening on VNC. Public VNC, right? All right, let's do it. Anyway, that was fun. But yeah, so um, also uh, the fu fun part about VNC is that um, the command line versions of VNC won't let you use a password shorter than five or shorter than six characters, and you can see here the the fourth line item there that CMP compare compare racks to OX5, which is basically saying compare this value to five, uh, which is the password length. So uh, my very very first binary patch ever was patching VNC password to change this to one instead of five, so I can use a one character password. Then scripting it uh, using VNC snapshot. To, so this is like no, no touch, right? I didn't actually connect a VNC client to these things. It was all entirely screenshot using this command line tool. But to, to automate that, to get all these screenshots, um, you have to use VNC password at the command line, otherwise it forces you to specify credentials every, time, every single time. So the password um, is really, really bad. It's, uh, I guessed it, it's laughably the uh, company's name. Um, and you get stuff like this, which is like, one sign, like at the very, very top, this is a bad screenshot, but the very, very top left there, you can see that tiny little square, that's the ad, that's, that's what's on the sign. Uh, so I just let this thing go and it got a whole bunch of these, a whole bunch of these screenshots, I have like probably 300, um, and then I'm just paging through them thinking like, well there's not a lot interesting going on here, um, and then I started noticing like signs I'd seen before, signs that maybe you guys saw a couple months ago in Vegas, like this one, and like this one, and I was like, oh boy, there's a whole bunch of these in Vegas that are just public, you can just mess with them. So, and the other thing to consider is like, if you go back and look at these screenshots, look at the start bar. Anybody recognize what OS this is? It's XP, they're still shipping XP. So, right, I'm here, I'm like, all right, this is a big deal, I should probably say something about it, because, you know, use your imagination, you control 300 of these signs across the United States, suddenly, just because you guessed a password. What do you do? You could do some pretty evil stuff. Um, so I wrote a big long letter on uh, April 8th to Yesco, the company. And I said, well, I won't read it to you, but TLDR, this is bad, you should look into it. I'm a security researcher, I'll help. Don't worry, like I'm not gonna charge you, please just let me help, this is scary stuff, let's, let's sort it out. And I literally got this back, which was like, nope, go away. Okay, all right, three days later, and this, I promise this was not me, because like a dozen people asked. A billboard in Atlanta, Georgia got hacked, hacked, uh, and it was made to display Goatsy. And it made the news, and the FBI got involved, and it was really funny. Um, yeah, you, you see how heartbroken I am over this, right? So this is, the di this is the timeline. You can see how it lines up kind of funny. But like, so April 8th, I write them this big letter. Uh, the sign gets uh, Goatsy'd on the 10th, which wasn't really news at the time, didn't, didn't, uh, uh, didn't really make the news yet. Uh, I sent a follow-up email and the reason that I got this reply was because this poor guy was dealing with the fallout of having the sign being goatseed and dealing with law enforcement and stuff like that. So he actually called me afterwards and was, so to his credit, to this, this dude Brian's credit, um, he has nothing to do with the actual science. He's on the business side of the house. He's like a networking engineer for the, for the company and he works in you know, the business side of stuff. So uh, I sadly never ever had contact with anybody from the sign side of the house. So it's a lot, a lot of this. Um, so randomly, like last Saturday, like uh, six days ago, last Saturday, uh, I went to check, and it's still up. Like the sign gets goatseed, the FBI gets involved, they take it down, it makes the news, everyone flips out, but it's like back. And for a while, it was if you if you went to Shodan and searched for Prison View, it was the first, it was the first result. So I was, wow. So end of the story, right? So where did we leave off, right? We have dog science security. Um, 
that's sort of the that's sort of the prevailing mantra. Um, it's it's from the researcher's perspective, it's difficult to uh, ascertain what sort of result you're going to get based on like your first comms with the company, unless there's some sort of existing um, relate, not maybe existing relationship or uh, existing history of an organization working with security researchers when talking about security, um, secure disclosure or responsible disclosure. Um, except for you know yesterday when when um, the, you know the whole fire eye debacle happened. Now we know exactly what not to do. Um, for anybody in the crowd or listening afterwards, then uh, you want to. If you have any questions about how to deal with responsible disclosure as an organization, whatever you do, just don't do what FireEye did, and you'll probably be okay. Um, so, like TLDR, not a lot of people care unless you make them care, which is it's kind of hard. Like you know, from the organization, you'll hear security is a time suck. It doesn't make us any money. It's really expensive, and there's is there's no risk. Uh, they, they will say that there's no risk, but then you have, you know, shells and goatsy. Uh, it does fill a legal checkbox if you actually do the disclosure, which makes things really helpful. So in this case, um, because I had in writing from the company, we don't care, uh, it sort of makes it really easy to go and do a presentation or do further research or collect screenshots or do what have you because I have it in writing. They told me it was okay. Of course, after yesterday, that might not be so... Um, easy, well, it's easy to defend, I was going to say, but I don't know what, where FireEye is going to, where, that, where that's going to go because they have like this documentation trail of, yes, everything's okay, yes, everything's okay, wait, I changed my mind, I'm going to hit you with a bus. Um, so, right, so like effectively responsible disclosure, who cares? Well, we do, or the security researchers are the ones, we're going to have to be the ones that drive this entire like methodology, we're going to have to be the ones that sort all this out because it's very obvious that in the vast majority, um, the organizations that we report stuff to, they just don't care. Um, so, you know, on one side of the house, you can say, uh, I found a bunch of stuff and I would like to do a talk on it, or I found a bunch of stuff and I want to report it. You can do both, uh, but it seems that the, the probably the smart thing to do would be to first disclose it and see what they say. And in the vast majority of times, you're going to either have a company that doesn't care or isn't interested or doesn't respond or whatever. But in, in terms of the researcher, you'll, you're, you're filling your own checkbox to say, I have fulfilled my legal obligation to notify the organization. And now I can effectively talk publicly about it because you know, I have it in writing. They say it's OK. So I went a lot faster than I was expecting. So I will now hand you over to OJ, who has another amusing story about lols and shells. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Fuck fire, right? <clears throat> um, so, <laughs> so yeah, my name's OJ. Um, I'm not going to follow up with a story that's as interesting as uh, as go seeing billboard signs, but I have a, a pretty interesting experience um, doing disclosure with with Seagate, and I say I'm a Seagate troll victim, and that's kind of what it felt like in the early days. But that's not really how it ended up. So what I'd like to sort of tell you about is the bug that I found, the process that I went through disclosing, and then a really interesting insight that I had with the business um, at the end before it all wrapped up. So these, um, these are the devices that I was testing through a fairly typical pen test on site with a client. Um, they are officially the two and four bay NAS devices that, uh, that Seagate uh, have on their shelves. And, um, yeah, they, they did some interesting stuff with, uh, with their development and their architecture of the, the front end of these devices. And if anyone out there's played with things like NAS devices, particularly Seagate NAS devices, you probably won't be surprised with what I'm about to tell you. So uh, out of the box, this thing runs PHP 5.2.3, which was released quite a long time ago. Um, what's funny about this is that this device is actually pretty new. So why they're using this version of PHP now is, uh, is rather concerning. Um, this thing obviously was susceptible to the well-known uh, null byte truncation attack that you can use in, in various things like the, uh, the include and require functions. So you can just arbitrarily truncate paths that are generated behind the scenes and you can end up including stuff that wasn't necessarily intended to be included. Um, on top of that, they were using an old version of something called CodeIgniter, which is a, a PHP development framework. Uh, again, very, very old and had known issues with it. In this case, the one that's pretty interesting is, um, I call it crap, 
cookie protection. But there's an official term. But behind the scenes, what this thing does is it generates uh, cookies that contain serialized PHP objects and it's encrypted with a static key using XOR. So that was a particular, in fact, I didn't even have to do the work to find this out because somebody else had already done that for me. And then on top of that, they had their custom application. So if you think out of the box, they've started with a shit version of PHP and a shit version of a framework. On top of that pile of shit, you're going to end up with probably a bigger pile of shit. Um, and so my very first CVE in the history of my research was finding a static encryption key on every NAS device that they, uh, they've released. So not exactly uh, a shining beacon of, of genius, but hey, it's a CVE and I'll take it. So the vulnerability um, that, that I found was, um, as I said, the, the, <laughs> the cookie was basically just a serialized PHP object. And um, when you know that encryption key, which you can get through two ways, the first is buy an as device, and the encryption key that's on yours is the same as on everybody else's. Or you can brute force it, because behind the scenes, what it uses um, inside this, this little session key, a uh, session, cookie is the user agent string, which is something you control. So you can repeatedly throw stuff in the user agent string and see what comes back, and slowly but surely it will leak the key that it's using. And that's exactly what, uh, what was possible in this case. What I loved about this is on the NAS, it wasn't actually tracking any sessions. So if you sign into your NAS as admin, and then take that cookie and point it to a completely different NAS, then you're an admin on the other NAS too. So that applies across the board, you know, if you're called Bob and there just happens to be Bob on the other NAS, then you're Bob as well. So that was, that was a nice little feature. So these cookies contain uh, a few bits of information. The interesting ones are the username. So if you're able to generate your own cookies, and pro tip, you can when you know the key, you can change your name from Bob to admin, Prevesk. On top of that, uh, there was a language element. I'm pretty sure that anyone in this room that has played with PHP apps in particular has stumbled across language parameters in pretty much any app and gone, yeah, I'm probably going to be able to do some kind of path traversal because behind the scenes it's taking that ENUS and shoving it in a file path and, and generating a path to a file that they can include the language specific strings with. Um, but my favorite out of all of them was this. <laughs> Man. You reckon this was validated? No. So uh, you could actually modify this and set it to yes, and regardless of your name, you would have administrative privileges on the NAS. So the exploit part is actually pretty simple. You get a session by making a get request, and it gives you a cookie. You were supposed to extract the encryption key, but you don't actually have to do that, like I said, because it's the same. Um, you elevate to admin by changing the word no to yes. Um, you, then, <laughs> you then write your shell in whichever format you like onto the disk, and then you use a local file include vulnerability using the language parameter with the null byte truncation trick. So you've got this clusterfuck of really simple issues that result in remote root access pre-auth. Because on every NAS, you know, you run as root, right? That's what web servers do. So here's a little screenshot of a, a proof of concept um, script that I wrote that basically just you point it at a NAS and hit go and it gives you a root shell. There's nothing genius going on here, but I just thought I'd like to prove that it actually works. Um, there's a Metasploit module as well. Um, as an MSF contributor, I like to just throw everything in Metasploit, um, and so I did that for this as well. Uh, and that was actually all the easy bit. The hard bit was dealing with the disclosure. So. Uh, Again, this was my, my sort of first big venture into the disclosure story, and I thought, no, I'll, I'll deal with this myself and, uh, and see how bad it can be. Surely it can't be that bad. Well, it was. Um, to start with, there was no public way of contacting the organization. There was no PGP. There's, it, you know, there was just nothing. If you search for security in Seagate, all you find is abuse, um, which isn't exactly a great way to start. So I thought, let's do the sensible thing and go to Twitter, right? Yeah, um, no, that was, that was not a good decision. But what I'd like to walk you through is just a little bit of the conversation that I had with the poor sods who are running the, uh, the Twitter account. But before I move on to that, fuck FireEye. 
Okay, so this was the first tweet that I, I posted to them, and uh, literally I was just saying, hey, I have no idea how to get in touch with someone who cares about this stuff. Uh, please let me know. And the immediate response was, what specific concern are you talking about? Please let us know. So I thought, okay, well, I can't really fit the content of a disclosure inside a DM via Twitter, so I'll come back with, no, I'd, I'd rather get some, some other way that's a bit more secure that I can validate who I'm speaking to, you know, that kind of stuff. The response was, go over here and punch something into the support site. Oh, okay. Um, no, that's still not right. So I responded with, look, you're not listening. I don't need tech support. I want to tell you that something's horribly broken. Um, and then I went there and had a look around. It was kind of this open forum. And I wasn't sure that what I was posting was actually going to appear in a private inbox for the support people or whether it was going to end up on a forum for the whole world to see. And I thought, well, I'd rather not run the risk of the latter, so I'll go back and ask them if there's some other way that I can guarantee that things are hidden. So I said, you know, that doesn't really give me the options that I'm happy with. Can you please give me a bit more information? And, uh, and they came back with, we don't have a direct email to engineers or programmers. However, an email with details may be escalated. May be escalated for investigation, which was comforting. Well, not really. Um, and I said, look, I don't care who I speak to as long as they care about security. That, that's really what I care about. And most of the time in organizations like this, the programmers have other agendas, and security, unfortunately, isn't one of them. Um, so just, just tell me who to speak to that cares about security. Again, we don't have a direct contact. Please just do as we've told you before and go back to the, the support forum. So I, I kind of took it on the chin and said, yep, OK, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. And I DM them and said, look, this is the support ticket number that you gave me. And then I got an interesting message about three hours after I sent this one. Can you all read that? To verify before we pass this along, did you verify whether or not the password had been saved in the browser? I don't know whether that you've noticed, but I haven't talked about browsers or anything at all. It was like all just curl and, and calls directly to HTTP. So obviously at this point I'm thinking, well, the people behind the poor old Twitter account really don't know what they're talking about, and they're trying to deal with me in the most sensible way, but uh, I came back with, look, I have no idea how that question is relevant. Did you actually intend to give that to me? <laughs> and so uh, the response was great. Welcome to Twitter. This is English only. Our Twitter support staff will be available to help you from Monday to Friday, 8 p.m. And obviously, at that point, I threw my hands in the air and gave up. Um, so lesson number one out of this is don't expect anything from Twitter. And that's probably going to apply regardless of what you're talking about. Um, so I thought, right, let's move back over to frontline support through the support channel and, uh, and see what they say. So the first of the interesting emails I got back basically said, you know, we're working on it. Thanks for your efforts and give us, give us time to have a look at things. And if you have further inquiries, then, then please let us know. Um, had a little bit more back and forth. They kind of refused to give me more PH, a P, a PGP key or anything like that. It was literally give us all of the detail, um, including the exploits, including all this other stuff via plain text. And, um, and so I thought, OK, well, you've asked for it. It's no longer my responsibility if this goes out of my hands and ends up in the hands of somebody who shouldn't have it. So they got the lot. On the 22nd of October last year, <clears throat> excuse me, I gave them absolutely everything, into, including the two working exploits. They said, thank you very much. This was quite, kind of fascinating, because in my, my first email, I said, this, this works on the very latest version of your firmware including three or four previous versions um, based on what I was able to test. Um, and so this, this email didn't really fill me with confidence because it, it's pretty clear that they didn't read what I had sent them. So at which point I went through the typical table flipping thing and, and kicked the cat and went and had a beer and, uh, and came back a few days later and said, look, you're not listening. You obviously haven't read. Please just have another look. Run the script on one of your devices and you know, it will tell you whether they're vulnerable. They came back to me a few days later and said, thanks for your response. We value the input that you have provided. Seagate strives to raise the bar in all areas of customer service and products, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, sorry. We will then determine if a patch is required or not. Then, at this point, they're saying they're still not sure whether there's a bug. 
So that's why I'm like, just run the fucking pock. You literally push button, receive bacon. That's how it works. So I get this back. Thank you for this information. We value the input that you have provided, and Seagate strives to raise the bar in all areas of customer service and products. And it's like, I feel like I've seen this before. It's almost exactly the same, but this was from a different person, someone who had chimed into the, the discussion sort of halfway along. So uh, again, responded with, you know, this stuff doesn't matter. I've already given you everything that you need to know. Please just go and use the, uh, the script. Um, on the 17th of December, I got an email back. So this was a number of weeks later. And it said, our engineers are requesting the firmware version of the NAS you have used in your script. We'd like to ensure you're not using beta firmware that has SSH enabled. <laughs> I was getting pretty shitty by now. So lesson number two, don't expect anything from frontline support either. So at this point in, in the timeline, I'm thinking, well, clearly I'm not speaking to the right person. And as someone who's done dev for about 14 years, I was thinking, if it were me who had built this product and someone out there had found these issues, I would really appreciate it if they made an effort to get hold of me. If they made an effort to get past all the shitty support that they had been dealing with and actually talk to me. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll just ignore all those email chains now. I'll assume that nothing's going to happen, and I'm going to go find the people who care. So at the beginning of January this year, I trawled through LinkedIn and found a bunch of people who matched Seagate and security, and I spammed them. There was about five, five or so. And, uh, and not long after that, I actually had a response on the 10th from someone who was in the CSERT team inside Seagate. He came back with a seagate.com email address and a PGP key. It's like, fucking yes. <laughs> Finally, this, by the way, this dude down the bottom here is an Australian guy who I hate, but I love this GIF. I think this GIF is awesome. Anyway, so that's how I felt. I was, I was cheering. I finally had hold of someone who clearly was employed to care about security. So we had a really good discussion. There was a lot of email back and forth. Um, things really looked like they were starting to improve. He was, he was dealing with the product team. He was keeping me informed. A couple of days later, he actually said, hey, I just used your scripts on this NAS, and it worked. I'm like, yes, I love you. You're awesome. And he was really, really awesome. I'm not going to name names, because I don't think that's appropriate. But he, he was seriously good, and, and it was really great. So at this point, Quite a bit of time had gone past. And up front, when I'd said to these guys I'd found this bug, that I was going to give them 100 days to do something. And if, they were gonna, if they'd done something and they needed more time, all they had to do was ask for it, which they never actually did. They never asked for an extension. But at this point, I thought, OK, I've got hold of the right people. The person who was responsible for the product is now aware. Should they be held to the same timeline as the original people that I had spoken to? And I thought about it for a little while, and I thought, you know what, I don't think that's fair. So without being asked, I said to them, I'm going to extend the timeline. And I had some, a bit of rationale about it, and I posted it up on, on the blog, so if you feel like having a read, then please do. But I, I said to them, look, I'm going to extend the deadline by 30 days, which gave them about 45 to 50 days at that point. And I thought, that's still pretty reasonable. And I was waiting for them to ask for more. Um, later on, I was asked by someone um, from my Digital Times, what would I have done if they came back and asked, can we have another week? And I said, I'd have given them three. I'd have given them to fix it, time to fix it, release the patch, give people time to patch, and then I would have gone public. But again, they never actually asked me for it. But along the way, this guy who I was dealing with actually got in touch with me multiple times without me having to ask for updates. So the tables really had turned. This guy really did care. He couldn't really give me too much detail because reasons, which is fine. But it was exciting. Unfortunately, though, it didn't last. I got kind of all excited, and I was really pumped. And time flew, and we got pretty close to the disclosure deadline. And, uh, and I emailed the guy, and I said, hey, mate, what's going on? Can you give me an update? And uh, I kind of sensed this frustration when he responded. He just said, I'm sorry, I have no updates for you. So, OK, well, this guy sounds like he's, he's kind of resigned to the fact that it's going public. And so, as promised, on the 1st of March this year, I just dropped the lot. Um, 
again, because of my affiliations with the Metasploit guys, that that exploit landed in Metasploit in less than an hour, and um, people started to have a bit of fun with it on their own NAS devices, of course. Nothing to do with Showdown. Anyway, I, I was a little bit disappointed. I was hoping that the experience of disclosing to a company like Seagate was going to be a little bit better than it was. But just under a couple of weeks later, I had contact from the same guy, and he said, would you be open to coming uh, on the phone and having a chat with us? And I thought, you know, I'm Australian and you're American, and we think you guys just sue everybody all the time, so I, I was pretty scared. <laughs> So I responded with, hey, you know, who's on the call and what's the purpose and are you going to sue me and all that kind of stuff. And they responded with, no, there's, it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one with someone who is really, really high up in the organisation. And when they told me who it was, I was, I was pretty surprised. Um, this person, again, who will remain nameless, um, he gave me a, half of his Sunday afternoon on Skype and just laid it all out. And it was incredibly refreshing. And it taught me some things that I didn't expect to be taught. And it shined a light on an area of the organisation which obviously I wouldn't have been able to um, see without him being so candid. And, uh, and it was a great discussion and it really did change my perception um, of the business and it kind of changed how I felt about how they dealt with the, the problems. So he and his team, the guys who I was dealing with in the latter half of this process, were all part of CSERT. And there was no internal PCERT at all. And for many years, this particular individual had been pushing really hard to get PCERT going inside Seagate, but was still fighting. And apparently behind the scenes, when I was going through this process, particularly towards the end, they were all looking forward to me dropping the stuff publicly, which was great. And as soon as it went public, you know, they threw it in the face of the rest of the organisation. And they're like, look what happens when we don't do the right thing. But what I learned after speaking to these people, is that despite, you know, the perception that we have and the fact that, you know, we've done free stuff and they should just go and fix it and stop complaining, that there's actually a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that we don't really know about and we don't understand, particularly for really large organisations. Um, in this case, what was really clear to me after speaking to this person was that they really do want to do better. The people who are hired in the security space want to do better. Part of the problem they have is that they need to educate the rest of the org. Um, and if the rest of the org doesn't care, it really doesn't matter how much they fight. So internally, they're held back by all kinds of bureaucracy. They're held back by the fact that they are not part of the teams who are responsible for the product. They're held back by the fact that they have so many other responsibilities as well. And Seagate is a pretty big org. So the amount of resources they have to deal with this stuff are actually pretty limited as well. There's barriers between the teams. You know, devs are so focused on getting features and new product out there because that's the important thing and security is just this noisy thing that gets in the way of those releases. And more importantly, I think they're still learning about this stuff just like we are. And I think as attackers, we have it pretty easy and, and as defenders and people who are responsible for product, we actually, they have it quite a bit harder than, than we do. It was also clear that, you know, despite um, the perception, they do really like the stuff we do. There are people inside these orgs who really do enjoy watching the fallout of these things because it allows them to take that and go, look, this is, this is what we need to do to improve, otherwise this kind of stuff is going to happen more. And they do use what we do as a catalyst for change internally, um, which is a bit cliched, I admit, but in this case that certainly proved to be the case. So lesson three is kind of a shitty spin on Hanlon's razor for me, but it's a don't put, down, don't put down to malice or incompetence what can be put down to bureaucracy or internal politics. And, and that was a, a bit of a, um, a realisation for me when I finished speaking to this guy. Um, another lesson is uh, our egos are not the only ones that are involved, and we've got to understand that the people on the receiving end of this stuff um, may not have received it before and have never dealt with this kind of thing, so we probably should be a little bit more reasonable when dealing with them. And we don't actually know everything there is to know about coordinated disclosure or responsible disclosure. And there's a lot of things that can prevent either side of the equation from doing the right thing, whether that it's reasonable or not. Um, so anyway, that's, they're the kind of big takeaways that I had. Um, 
if I do decide to do this again, which I'm, I don't know whether I will, um, I would certainly be keeping these things in mind when I'm talking to people. But I think as, um, as researchers, as people who find these things, there's, there's one thing that I think all of us could do better, and this is a bit of a personal mantra of mine, and that is try to be less of a dick today than you were yesterday. All right, if we could all do that every day, then, then that would be utterly awesome. Um, so as a final note, thank you, and fuck fire. Thank you.